Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who is watching this, as well as our esteemed speakers. I hope you and your families are safe. It is my absolute honor to invite you, to welcome you to this event. So we're at the last few days of the High Level Political Forum to review and discuss the progress we've made, the challenges we are facing, but most importantly, what we must and can do better. It has reinforced the power of multi-sector responses, partnerships, and as well as the importance of working together, particularly during these hard times. I am Maziko Matemvu. I'm the Vice President of the Young Feminist Network, as well as the Vice Chairperson of the Adolescent and Youth Constituency at PMNCH, and I will be your moderator for this session. COVID-19 has been a stark reminder of the inequities that exist in our societies. The disruption caused by the pandemic has halted and reversed progress that has been made. A recent survey shows that substantial disruptions persist over one year into the pandemic with about 90% of countries reporting one or more disruptions to access to essential health services. The pandemic has affected us all and has showed us the importance of working together. We cannot fall back on our commitments and really need to work together to ensure that we rise to respond to recover and that will be the focus of our discussions today. It's quite clear that women, children and adolescents are disproportionately affected by pandemics like this. How will we progress if we leave behind 1.2 billion voices of the youth population across the world? And how can progress be sustainable if we do not consider the vulnerabilities that women, children and adolescents are facing. Today we will be discussing all these issues with inspirational speakers from all over the world and before we start this panel I would like to cite the call to action by PMNCH and partners. For everybody who is watching right now I would like to call everybody to number one Take action for, for women, children, and adolescents. Number two, to deliver the response on multi-sector response, as well as to ensure nothing for us without us. On a housekeeping note, I would like to inform everyone that we will not be having a live Q&A, but I would like to implore everyone watching right now to please use the chat function to um, share remarks, reflections, and pose any questions. Before we start our panel, we'll be hearing from inspirational speakers from all over the world. And you will agree with me that there is an energy that comes from young people. They not only want to see a change, but they also want to be a part of the change. Before we move ahead with the panel, I would like us to, to listen to one of the youth, um, inspirational youth leaders, and her name is Mumbi Macharia, and she's a Kenyan writer, a spoken word poet, as well as a self-published author. Um, Mumbi's mantra is something that is, I find, deeply admirable. She says that you cannot write poetry before you start telling the truth. And it is the truth that we are all here today to ensure that nobody is left behind. Here's a video from Mumbi. They say you're on the menu if you're not seated at the table. Allow me to introduce myself. I am the girls in the pictures you commission of abject poverty. I know it sounds poetic, but I assure you, our lives are not an aesthetic. Perhaps you didn't know that I am the girl staying home from school because I don't have pads, my future. They took that. I am the girl walking to school with a stomach heavier than my book bag. This is my life. I am no different from the girl you heard about being sold off at 12 as a wife. I am not a charity case. But that's the picture you get. I see I am my grandmother's legacy. I come from a long line of matriarchal forces, rainmakers, healers, warriors, especially. My mother and grandmother now say they hope I forgive them for bringing me into a world where my very existence is a transgression, where demanding change is mundane and violence against my sisters is just another Monday. This is to you, our world leaders. 
the ones who have our trust are less than few you made all these promises you said you'd pursue so why does the mortality rate and gender-based violence still have the longest queue strange so this is to let you know that if you want to buy my vote i don't want notes i just want change love is a verb so I don't just want you to talk about it, I need you to be about it in every sector, health, economy, climate, community. This is your opportunity in every room to put my sisters first, even the ones still in the womb. We've come a long way. So I pray that the strides we made before the pandemic are not receding, we are pleading. Do not leave us behind. We have options, but no choices, opinions, but no voices. It's time, it's been time to rise, refocus, recover. Wow, that was a powerful poem by Mumbi. And one of the things that I really loved about what she said is that love is an action. And it really started to make me think critically about how important the call to action for adolescents is very, very important. We need to make sure that we are meaningfully engaging young people and adolescents beyond just implementation and just beyond as beyond beneficiaries we need to ensure that we're engaging them in the design in 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 the design the policy making and all those processes so as we dive deep into the issues of equity in the era of covid-19 and the sdgs we must remember these words because they are true to the most vulnerable in 2019, the United Nations issued a call to mobilize a decade of action on three levels, the global action, the local action, and the people action. Now, with COVID-19, we have witnessed action or inaction in all these levels. Now, it is a time to quicken our steps and come together again. It is my absolute honor to introduce our next speaker. She is the UN Deputy Secretary General, Ms. Amina Mohammed, for her reflections and a plea to all those who are watching and those who have the vision, the power, and the resources to make the decade of an action, the decade of action a reality. Here is uh, Ms. Amina Mohammed. I thank Your Excellency, President Kaudilade of Estonia, the Secretary General's Global Advocate for Every Woman, Every Child, and the Right Honourable Helen Clark for their unsparing efforts on behalf of women, children and adolescents. The COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented global crisis, but it has not affected us equally, and it will continue to widen and expose inequities. Once again, women and girls are bearing the brunt. We have seen a global surge in domestic violence and spikes in child marriage. The pandemic has overwhelmed health systems in many places, heightening the risk of women dying from complications of pregnancy and childbirth and disrupting routine childhood immunizations. We should also recognize the profound impact on the mental health of adolescents and young people, which could last into adulthood. Even before the pandemic, progress towards reducing maternal and child mortality had slowed. Now we must double down on delivering the Every Woman, Every Child global strategy for women's, children's and adolescents' health, which is our roadmap for ending preventable deaths and diseases and is aligned with the Sustainable Development Goals. I trust the leadership of WHO and the UN system as a whole will continue to support this important work with a sense of urgency and scale, especially at the country level. The gaps that the pandemic has widened and which further marginalise those most vulnerable must be overcome through strength and coordination and partnerships globally and nationally. And we must start now, even as COVID-19 still rages in many parts of the world. We cannot afford to let the situation for women and children worsen. Instead, we must step up investments and build more resilient primary health care systems as part of the recovery. Together, let's seize this pivotal moment to make the decade of action a reality and to leave no one behind. Thank you. With this powerful message from the UN Deputy Secretary, Secretary General, let us watch a video on where since we have 
on where we are since last year when we discussed the Protect the Progress in September. What actions need to be taken if we indeed are serious to ensure women's, children's and adolescents' health, rights and well-being and address deeply rooted inequalities and inequity? Here is the video and let us watch on what the practical next steps could be. Wow, what an inspirational video that moved me and I'm sure everybody else who is watching. It's clear that there is a lot of work at hand and strong commitment, leadership and accountability are required to move the needle and recover better and fairer.
I now hand over to the Right Honourable Helen Clark, who is the PMNCH board member and former Prime Minister of New Zealand, to move ahead and moderate the esteemed panel on what are the major challenges we must overcome and how to keep our promises and commitments, particularly to those furthest and left behind. Thank you. Thank you, Mazika, and greetings to everyone from New Zealand. And let me thank, uh, at the very beginning, the Government of Estonia uh, for sponsoring uh, this event and welcome all participants on behalf of the organisers, a partnership for maternal, newborn and child health, PMNCH, and UNICEF, UNFPA, WHO, and Universal Health Coverage 2030. So in July every year, uh, countries come together at the high level political forum at the United Nations to report on the progress they're making on achieving the sustainable development goals. They discuss the challenges they've faced and they reflect on how we can keep that promise of delivering sustainable development to the global population. And that promise had a major commitment to leave no one behind. Of course, as we've just seen in the video, the COVID-19 pandemic has been an awful setback. But the experience we must take out of it is that we're only strong when we work together in the common good. And we hope during this event to inspire further collaboration in support of the health of women, children, and adolescents. Those of us who are part of this discussion today are of course fortunate to have access to the technology and the infrastructure that can bring us together in this way. But isn't it sobering to note that around half the world's population lacks access to basic essential health services and to the internet, that roughly one in every four births in our world isn't registered and nor are around four in every 10 deaths. Unfortunately, a common thread that links all those figures is that it is the most vulnerable, and that is often women, children, and adolescents who miss out the most. And now, as the video reminded us, COVID-19 has led to a reduction in access to essential sexual, reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health services. We saw family planning and immunization especially affected, and that leads to increasing illness and death rates among women, children, and adolescents. Women have also suffered more during the pandemic from loss of jobs and livelihoods because of the nature of the sectors uh, that they're in and other factors. They've suffered increased rates of poverty disproportionately and increased exposure to domestic and family violence. So the time has come as PMNCH urges for all of us to rise up, respond and recover from this horrible experience of the pandemic. And we are launching an action brief around how to rise, respond and recover today. So today we need to discuss what we can and must do to see that the inequities which do impact on women, children and adolescents are overcome. PMNCH's call to action on COVID-19 campaign urges governments to prioritize the health of women, children and adolescents in their COVID-19 response and recovery plans through strengthening their political commitment their funding, their policies, and their service delivery. It's going to be very important to improve the real time and data and the quality of the data that we have so that it's clear where the efforts need to be focused to make a big difference. Equity-based approaches are needed to end this pandemic and to deliver for women, children, and adolescents. So I have a, a wonderful panel today. Uh, I have uh, President uh, Kersti uh, Kaljulaid of Estonia, also recently appointed as the UN Secretary General's Global Advocate for Every Woman, Every Child. We have uh, Gabriela Cuevas Baron, former president of the Interparliamentary Union and current co-chair of the UHC, Universal Health Coverage, 
2030 Steering Committee. We have Berger Brenda, the president of the World Economic Forum. And we have Josiah Tualamili, co-founder of the Pacific Youth Leadership and Transformation Council from New Zealand. Tarofa Lava, Josiah. So great to have these four panelists with us today. And I'm going to start the conversation with the president of Estonia, Estonia President Kersti. Congratulations on your appointment as the SG's advocate on every woman, every child, at this critical time for women, children, and adolescents' health. As you reflect on how the health of women, children, and adolescents has been affected by the pandemic, what do you think the global community could be doing better to mitigate the impact of the pandemic and protect the progress which had been made for women's, children's and adolescents' health before the pandemic, and which obviously is at such terrible risk now. Over to you, President Kersti. Well, I think it's extremely important that the words of girls like Wumbi from Kenya reach uh, out globally and, and that we hear these girls speaking uh, and, and we reflect a little bit also on what is going on in our own countries, because no one is exempt in all countries, also the most developed countries. The position of women has been a little bit falling back a few steps downwards from where it was. And now imagine these women, children and adolescents who were already in precarious situation before the pandemic. For them, a small regress is critical, dramatically critical, and we have to recognize this. And I've been thinking here also why we have been stalling in our objectives already before the crisis. The thing that it is about maybe 20 years ago when women started to get a louder voice, started to advocate for their rights, then we called for a decade of the action. And we've really seen that the numbers have been getting better, what we have been measuring. Yes, we know a big part of the problem is not even measured because as you yourself said, every fourth birth is never registered and, and therefore death neither probably. But we've seen numbers getting better and what you do, pay attention to and measure you normally always get. But now we have stalling because we got used to that numbers are getting better. And, and therefore immediately they stopped, which demonstrates that it has not become a natural part of the political debate in absolutely every country to pay attention to the situation of women, children and adolescents globally. And that is, I see our role to make sure that it is an inherent and natural part of a debate in absolutely every country. I per personally am ready to go and advocate for women, children and their rights wherever the need is biggest. And then, of course, we gather a lot of aggregate data and we see globally that we are not going in the right direction. But the data we have does not actually give us reasons. The numbers in any country may look similar, for example, for maternal mortality. But the reasons could vary. We have to describe exact bottlenecks and use the resources what we have to address these bottlenecks. For example, in the country where you have women who are not allowed to go to doctor or where there is quite a lot of, uh, of uh, teenage pregnancy, then probably just better training and better access to, uh, to, uh, to the know-how for medical personnel is not going to help us. We need to address always the bottleneck, find the most effective way of trying to help every country. But for that, we need to break down that general data which we have. And then we need to apply the principle of subsidiarity. The action needs to be taken at the local level. And the most difficult thing in these, indeed is to define the suitable action at the local level. And you know how to do it. You really can do it if you give the right to decide to the community level so that they decide, we need to trust the communities, what is the best and most efficient method to address these problems, in particular communities. Reaching global down to the local, accepting subsidiarity principle in all the chain should make us efficient and effective. And then I have a final comment. How can we provide nutrition, vaccination services to anybody whom we don't know they exist? So I'm calling on all global leaders and all national leaders. Let's finally accept that we need to create in every country a system where every mother can register birth of a child 
as easily as they can transfer money nowadays over mobile phone. It is a basic service, basic digital tool, which is even in the most remote areas quite accessible. Because even in Africa, you have 40% of people who have mobile phones and you can actually use even 2G to let this little signal get through to your government. There is a baby who is being born, who needs vaccination and who needs support and help all through their life. We are accepting that globally we can exchange our vaccine certificate. How on earth can we not get this far that we will give every baby an electronic birth certificate globally? The time is right. We are doing this for our developed world needs. We need to make sure that this same happens also for the less developed nations. This is our obligation to know who is being born and how we can help them. We are very, very far, 25% away from the mark, as you said, from that objective. It's really low, really low ambition. But let's fulfill this ambition and then we'll try to climb higher. Thank you, Helen, for asking me. Thank you so much, uh, President uh, Kirsty. And you heard President Kirsty say she will go anywhere to advocate for women, children, adolescents' health. So uh, I, th I think there's a lot to advocate for, and this will be a very busy role as global advocate. Let me come now to Gabriela Cuevas Baron, co chair UHC 2030 Steering Committee, and a member of parliament in Mexico. Gabriela, you have served. Uh, as president uh, of the IPU and now this uh, co-chair personship of UHC uh, steering committee, what do you think are immediate actions that political leaders, including the world's parliamentarians, need to take to address the direct and indirect health impacts of COVID-19? And how can we ensure that the most vulnerable and marginalized populations are not left behind in the rollout of universal health coverage and in preparing for and responding to future pandemic threats. Over to you, Gabriella. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen, and thank you to all for being here at this panel. Well, the, the availability of a health services depends on a functioning health system and consequential government commitment to health. And let's be clear, when it comes to government action, it is a matter of political will more than anything else. We need to promote a truly intersectional, gender responsive health systems approach, which is inclusive not only of gender, but also of age, race, sexual identity, socioeconomic status, and geography. We must also create stronger and financial, uh, a stronger social and financial safety nets beyond health systems to protect the livelihoods and welfare of vulnerable groups, including women, children, adolescents, the poor, the elderly, people with disabilities, migrant populations, the homeless, and people living in remote communities. In particular, women and girls, uh, we, we have to be very clear, especially after this uh, pandemic, we have been reported to face significant barriers to access health services owing to disproportionate distribution of care work, financial hardship, or lacking adequate transportation means to do so. Ensuring that their human rights is not neglected entails addressing these often deep-seated obstacles. Governments, health leaders, and advocates must work together to promote good health and well-being for all, focusing on a holistic, people-centered approach that prioritizes the most vulnerable and that aligns with the principles of human rights, gender responsiveness, and respecting the voices of people affected by or at risk of disease. Civil society is another crucial bridge between governments and those left behind in emergency responses. Participation should be institutionalized as an acknowledged formant relation for monitoring reviewing and making recommendations for tackling the solutions and actions that follow. The process should also be democratized so that all levels of political leadership, government and other stakeholders listen to and act upon the express needs and prioritize the people. Governments must also set clear targets to improve service coverage and financial protection to, and communicating them clearly 
to multi-stakeholder audiences at local, national, and global levels. National targets should public sites openly and made understandable and accessible for populations across all the world. Parliamentarians, of course, we also have an essential role in this regard. We are tasked with the oversight of government actions. It is our responsible to hold them to account. But at the same time, we have a huge responsibility. Nowadays, about 2.5 billion women and girls are still being discriminated by their own national legislation. So we need to change those laws. We need also to allocate budget for the most important needs. And that includes, of course, access to health. And yes, there's an uh, oversight and representation tasks that we need to deliver. We need to understand that recovering better will require a genuine, effective, multi-sexual approach by governments including local, municipal, and regional governments, and not only the health ministries alone. Uh, if we want to, to build this bridge between the global commitments and translate that into local realities, we need to bring everyone on board. Again, civil society, governments, parliamentarians, all different actors. Uh, that's possible, of course it's possible, and perhaps after a, a year and a half with a pandemic, it seems very far. But again, this is a matter of political will. And that's why we need to bring all different levels of governments, all different stakeholders to the same table. We need also, and allow me, Helen, to bring this to the table. We need also to understand that the process of voluntary national reviews should be transformed. While more countries and civil societies have recently reported progress in UHC, universal health coverage, there's a significant data gaps in most countries due to the shortcomings of global and particularly country health systems information. Stronger country data systems are needed to determine not only the percentage of people using a service, but also the need of quality of those services. There are very important changes at the national level. We can also benefit from exchanging those best practices in terms of changing the constitutions and recognizing health as a universal human right. There are also changes on, for example, governments that are getting rid of different fees for giving uh, access to health to different people. So health is a human right and universal access to health is a must. I'm sure that if we are able to understand that political will can be the drive, can be the force to make this human right a reality for all, regardless of religion, race, uh, uh, ethnic groups, gender, we can definitely change the world by 2030. Thank you so much for, for uh, allowing me to be part of this panel. And muchas gracias, uh, Gabriela. And staying with you for a moment, it, it seems like a lifetime ago, but it was only 2019 uh, that world leaders came to the high level meeting on universal health coverage and pledged to achieve the sustainable development goal target of having it by 2030. Uh, but uh, the pandemic uh, seems to have stalled action on, on that as well. What do you think are some of the very concrete actions that governments should prioritize to advance UHC in this current uh, context? And, and what about the role of, of health partnerships acting together uh, to accelerate progress? Your thoughts, please. Of course, Helen, thank you. I think that the first part is that uh, governments and all different stakeholders need to understand that we have to place people at the center of all decisions. And that includes, of course, advancing on universal health coverage, ensuring meaningful engagement and investing in health systems for all so that no, one, uh, no one's health is left behind. If we go to very concrete actions, of course, we need again to change uh, the legislation. We need to be clear that our laws, our constitutions are not discriminating anyone. The second part, of course, goes to, to public policy and budgets. Achieving universal health coverage supports all areas of health. It entails ensuring integrated coverage across wider population and mobilizing domestic resources. This has the potential to free up limited resources for more targeted health programs, including for women and girls' rights. There are very interesting initiatives that I would like to, to share. First of, 
of all is that we as individuals, as, as persons, we can take uh, our part too. We are organizing the International UHC Day on December 12th. This year's theme will be leave no one help behind, invest in health systems for all. We must prioritize equity, investing more in health and allocating resources efficiently and equitably according to need. Here we are going to ask, of course, of course to the countries, but also to people to take part of this campaign. Uh, you can upload your own histories. How are we experiencing access to health in our own countries? Of course, there are also very interesting national initiatives. I was mentioning that some countries are removing user fees to improve access to services. Yeah, in some cases, I think that uh, with the pandemic, we are experiencing that even in a more sensitive way. But uh, in many cases, money is making the difference between life of death or death. So we need to make a change. We need to take a view on what's happening with health insurance programs what's happening with the, the public health systems, and of course, to strengthen it. The other important part is that participation of civil society in health policy making. For some countries, the role of civil society could be a threat, but for many others, it's a very good opportunity to, bring, uh, to build that bridge between the governments, the parliamentarians, the state sphere, and what's happening at the local and the, at the community level. So if we're able to include civil society, we can make very interesting changes. It's about knowing how to understand different realities and how to implement different policies at the best uh, possible way. Of course, we also have some effective collaboration between governments and CSO, CSO uh, collaboration between, for example, the government and CSO has been effective in Fiji with a swift, comprehensive response. Uh, the Fiji Ministry for Disaster Management explicitly requested the assistance of civil society in the country's COVID-19 response. So, uh, or for example, I would like to mention my own country, Mexico, we just changed the constitution to warranty access to universal health coverage to all people. Of course, we need to go to every detail. Here, I think that the most complicated area could be the implementation processes. Uh, it's not the same to change the constitution or to change the law that to build hospitals or infrastructure or buying medicines or uh, being working together with the, the health workers. But we can benefit from exercises like this. This is also a best practice. If we are able to set a table to exchange the best practices at the national and local level, perhaps we can learn from each other. I, I think that's something that we are uh, missing from the uh, pandemic. There are very interesting examples of some heads of state that are taking the lead, that are making a significant change. And I'm unsure that we are going to be able to, to benefit from that. So again, it's about political will. It's about allocating budget. It's about changing the law and understanding that health is a right for all. Thank you very much, Helen. Muchas gracias, uh, Gabriela. Uh, let's come now to Josiah uh, Tuamali. Uh, Josiah, young people rightly remind us that decisions shouldn't be made about them without them. And we heard earlier in the video from Mumbi in Kenya, if you don't have a seat at the table, you are on the menu. Terrible thought. Young people are rightly claiming their seats in decision-making forums, and they're playing such critical roles in demanding climate justice, gender equality, and in standing up against discrimination of any form. So Josiah, what is your advice to governments and to development partners about how to engage young people meaningfully uh, and how to support young people as we seek to prioritize their health needs and access to appropriate services? Helen, or in Aotearoa, we might say Auntie Helen, um, for those who've grown up in New Zealand, as I have as a, as a young person, um, Alan was the longest serving Prime Minister at the time I was a child, which um, is quite special to be in this call tonight with you. Um, 
I actually wanted to reflect on a song that um, is, is part of my answer, a song that came out while you were our Prime Minister um, from uh, a Samoan young person like myself, um, New Zealander too, Brooke Fraser. In, in the song, Albertine, it goes, Now that I have seen, I am responsible. Faith without deeds is dead. Now that I have had you in my own arms, I cannot let go till you are. So in, in the song, in the chorus, she talks about faith without deeds is dead. And I guess to me, speaking as the young person in this conversation, we really, really not just need good thoughts, we need deep and meaningful deeds. Deeds from the heart, what we've been talking about so far is people-centred. If we can be seen as ourselves, not seen as a number, not seen as as, as, a, as something that gets lost in other populations, it's so important, as we're hearing in this call, we have to focus on maternal, we have to focus on adolescents, we have to focus on young people, because we want the equity to change. And some countries, that might be a difficult focus point, and there might be other national priorities, but please, for those countries and those organisations that haven't signed up to this, and there are many, including many in the Southern Hemisphere, you, you standing alongside us who are calling for, please, for you to help us in this way, that would be deeply meaningful. And to go on the second part of your question, Auntie Helen, I'd probably just say different and better decisions are made when we are involved. I was appointed at 22 years old to New Zealand's National Mental Health Inquiry there were six of us doing that review and I was the youngest person on, the, on that decision-making panel. We came to different decisions because I was there. And so I would challenge the world leaders in this call and, and, and anyone listening that, you know, when you go and give your speeches at the UN and, you know, many of them are super prepared and, you know, had every word vetted and all the rest of it, and that's important. But if you were to halve your time and elevate one young person or one civil society member from your country to share the platform and not look over their speech, to actually be able to enable people around the world to speak in these levels and these sessions of power and influence, the, the level of shift that could happen around the world is significant. And probably the second little thing is often we're encouraged to have our voice, and but it's not always particularly safe. And um, in New Zealand, we have seen, unfortunately, a number of politicians abuse their influence with young people, which makes it hard for me and other young people who are trying to encourage us to have more trust and more participation. So I guess as part of the call, I'm personally asking leaders, please regulate yourselves so that actually when we're asking for youth to be involved, that it's actually, they aren't being put on the line in a way that's unsafe. So, off time. Mafatai, uh, Josiah, and, and very good points. And you know, obviously, the more perspectives there are in decision making, the, the, the better the eventual decisions are going to be and the more relevant to those who uh, you know, need, need to you know, benefit from those, those decisions. We'll come back to you uh, shortly. Uh, now, coming to Borga Brenda, president of the World Economic Forum, headquartered in Geneva. Um, Borga, the Relationship between the public and the private sectors in health isn't always a straightforward one. So tell us a bit about where you see the opportunities for strengthened public-private cooperation and for the private sector accepting more responsibility, not just to shareholders, but also to societies. We know this is a, a very important concept for uh, the World Economic Forum, which has really uh, you know, promoted uh, that broader outlook for the private sector. So please come in now and, and talk to us about this. Well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Helen, and um, their colleagues, other speakers on the panel. Uh, it's uh, been uh, really uh, great to listen to all of your appeals. And uh, as you also indicated, Helen, uh, we have to count in business in the endeavors that we have to take and the steps we have to take uh, to meet the sustainable development goals, but also uh, to change uh, into a much more sustainable recovery uh, after COVID. And as you also mentioned, uh, Helen, the World Economic Forum has for 50 years been arguing for stakeholder capitalism, 
And what does this really mean? Uh, it is really arguing against uh, this notion of business of business is business. Of course, uh, business of business is to create jobs and uh, also uh, to do uh, good business. But uh, future-oriented company today need also to take much broader responsibilities. It needs to take a responsibility, of course, uh, towards uh, the employees in the company, but also uh, to the local community it's operating in, but also uh, much broader to the environment, but also when it comes to decent jobs. And we have seen during this pandemic that um, when challenged, business also rise uh, to uh, the occasion. We would never have developed uh, several vaccines in less than a year uh, if governments and uh, companies were not working uh, together. Usually it takes eight to 10 years uh, to develop these vaccines and we did it in less uh, than a year. But now we have to rely also on the same companies for uh, distribution, but also to contribute now uh, in the big challenges. On uh, the topic of today, we know uh, there are huge challenges. Uh, 3.6 billion people don't even have access to basic health care. This on top of the fact that 3.6 billion people cannot even follow what we are sharing today because they're not even connected uh, to uh, the internet. Looking forward, uh, I don't think we can reach the ambitious goals when it comes to women, children, and adolescents' um, health uh, topic without also mobilizing both resources, but also uh, more responsibility taken uh, from uh, the business sector. This is also based on the fact that no, we have launched stimulus that we have not seen, fiscal stimulus that we've not seen since the Second World War. 15 trillion US dollars have been put on the table. And many, many governments are now also uh, seeing that they have more limited fiscal muscles moving forward. So we really need to um, align around public-private partnerships, also uh, to think differently, but also in the resource mobilization. One of the paradoxes that we also have to raise today and remind ourselves, looking at, for example, the stimulus, only 2% of those 15 trillion US dollars put on the table have been allocated in the developing countries. And as we know, only 2% of the vaccines that are available now, those that are inoculated, are in Africa. This cannot continue. We really need uh, to break a lot of impulses here. And I, you can count on the World Economic Forum when it comes to also mobilizing business uh, in an unparalleled way uh, to make sure that we get a sustainable and fair recovery. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much uh, for those thoughts, uh, Borger. And you remind us really what what unequal tracks our world is on with this pandemic at, at the moment. And, and it is really, really shameful. You know, 2% of the vaccines administered in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, 2% uh, of the stimulus uh, in, the, in the, the, the less affluent uh, countries. Uh, we are all in this together. And I think you know, the, the message that none of us are safe to all of us are safe and we have to row this boat together to to get out of the, the trouble we're in is, is just so, so critical. But we can always count on the World Economic Forum for an inclusive voice and approach to that. So let me come back to President Kirsty. Um, Estonia is an acknowledged world leader on use of digital technologies, e-government, you name it, right, right at the forefront. And as uh, President Kirsty has already said in her first uh, intervention, uh, she sees a lot of ways in which using digital technologies can be very helpful in this area of uh, promoting uh, the health and health services for uh, women, uh, children and adolescents. So I'm going to give you scope, uh, Kirsty, to expand on that, um, you know, leveraging from Estonia's leadership uh, position uh, and perhaps particularly commenting on leveraging digital solutions to improve our understanding of who's being left behind and better focusing efforts 
to improve health outcomes for women, children, adolescents in the fragile and humanitarian and other vulnerable settings. Your thoughts on that, please. Thank you, Helen. I would first like to relate to something which Gabriela said. She insisted we need universal health coverage. And I just wanted to encourage all governments that if you get it right, it can really be quite efficient and you don't need to spend all your GDP on that. Estonia happens to be among the safest places to be born globally and, and all our other medical services are considered really efficient also by the World Health Organization. And we only spend 7% of our GDP on healthcare. It's a relatively low number actually. And this universal health cover which we provide has been growing for all of our people in solidarity. When we regained independence 30 years ago, Estonia was not a rich country, it was at the lower end of the middle income quite poor country. And we realized that if we provide in solidarity the healthcare to all our people, it cuts off the peaks. Indeed, many really good uh, medicines have not been available initially for Estonian citizens. But with the GDP growing gradually, it becomes more and more accessible also to, to all people of Estonia, the better and better medication, the better and better services. But we've all walked this walk together. We've all been in solidarity. So Estonian universal healthcare system means that still there are a few medicines like which you need to administer for millions of dollars for a child in a year. And for that, actually, Estonian people are quite happily voluntarily gathering money to cover these kind of exceptional uh, cases. There is a voluntary foundation which funds experimental healthcare uh, in cancer treatment in Estonia. But the government provided system is universal and it is a single payer scheme with competition on the provision side and it results in a real efficient and not very expensive universal healthcare. Estonian people are quite happy with this system and it has grown of age when the country's uh, uh, living standard has risen. But I would really like to stress that, that solidarity means not even the richest person in Estonia can have access through government funds to the better medication than the others. And it is so simple to, I mean, to decide. It only takes political leadership. Estonian leaders in 1990s were able to take this decision for all our citizens because nobody knew when in this race to free market economy, who will be the winner. But you never know what your fate is. So you should always apply this principle that you should legislate for those people whom you are not associating yourself today the good old, uh, good old uh, principle of uh, blindness about your own future. I mean, this is what you need to do to achieve universal healthcare. In digital service provision, as I said, indeed, Estonia has an e-health system where people could, I mean, check all the analyses which have been done and, and, and everything comes together for their next doctor's visit, which again adds to the efficiency and effectiveness. But this system, is something which you cannot build in a country where you do not know where your people are even. So I would still like to prize those governments who have recognized that digital identity for each and every citizen is necessary. Only today I'm sitting in Singapore. I had a meeting with Indonesian Minister of Economy and Telecommunications, and he assured me that Indonesia, a huge country which doesn't have so many resources, is giving digital identity to each and everybody born in their country which of course means that at least you know where to go and offer services later on. And you can start developing your e-health system, adding vaccination data for each and every child and so on. The system will gradually grow on you, but starting it off, just taking this first step, trust me, it's not expensive. It's just political will, which you need to have. And then gradually you can start building, building at the higher levels as your economy grows as your people get used to using these digital services. And I really want to stress once more, it's not kind of, we are talking about cosmos here. All people globally have some already experience of at least transferring money with their mobile phone. You can transfer personal data to the state databases. There is one little thing which you need to also recognize. Governments have to promise never to use this data against their people. Otherwise, people will not provide this data. And I would really want to prize the uh, private-public partnership approach, which also has been discussed here today. 
And uh, my, my best wishes and greetings uh, and gratitude go to uh, International Telecommunications Union, which has started a GovStack initiative where companies also from Estonia and Germany are developing a legal box of e-government services, which can be drawn down by those governments who want to develop their e-governance, but do not have adequate resources to do so. It's free to use and it's supported indeed by the private sector, this development. So greetings to ITU and all others who are with us in providing access to digital services and data in the uh, less developed and, and less lucky areas of, of this world. It's all about tiny children wanting to grow up. Let's never forget that. Mm. Thank you, President Kirsty. As Gabriella said uh, earlier, it's all about political will. And you've just reminded us that universal health coverage is about political prioritization. It's where do your priorities uh, lie? Uh, we have a saying in New Zealand that, that what is the most important thing in the world? It's people, it's people, it's people. And I think you, your comments reflected that so, so strongly. If I come back to Borga Brenda, um, President uh, Kaljulaid obviously has put a lot of emphasis on the importance of, of innovation uh, in really upping what we can achieve in, in healthcare and service provision generally. And the private sector, of course, generates an enormous amount of, of innovation. Uh, so how well do you think digital and other innovations are helping right now in combating the pandemic and addressing gaps in access to services? And what could we do more and better uh, to see that innovations benefit more women, children, and young people. Well, thank you, uh, Helen, for that uh, important uh, question. Uh, as I mentioned, we already seen uh, the last one and a half years that without innovations, we would not have had uh, the effective vaccines on the table today. I think it's incredible that we were able uh, to develop these vaccines in such a short time. We know that... Uh, uh, it would normally take a decade. And there are uh, also um, infectious uh, diseases and uh, also um, that we are not able, uh, we have not been able to develop vaccines against. Um, so uh, it was not a priori given that we were going to be successful. But when governments came together with private sector, governments put a lot of money 50 billion uh, on the table, and the pharmaceuticals also then uh, delivered in such a short time. How to make sure that we can see the same results also in other areas, uh, especially when it comes to healthcare. We know that waterborne diseases in many developing countries are 50% uh, uh, of the uh, sickness that we are seeing. I think something as basic as uh, clean water is also very much related to um, a lack of proper uh, sanitation. This is an area where there is so many low hanging fruits and we should work together with governments, uh, the UN and private sector to make sure that uh, every child, every woman, every adolescent have then access uh, to clean and safe uh, drinking water. We also seen uh, in the last decade when governments come together with the private sector and um, also incentivize uh, changes, changes really happen. In 10 years, the price of solar has fallen to one tenth. Who would have imagined that solar is now in many parts of the world, the most competitive energy source? 10 years ago, it had to be massively subsidized. Same with wind power. In 10 years, the price of wind power has fallen to one seventh. And now it is very competitive. What we will have to make sure is that the same innovative thinking is also happening around healthcare. There I do um, agree uh, with uh, President of Estonia underlining that for those countries uh, that uh, have the means, uh, universal uh, healthcare is uh, really uh, an important uh, answer to the challenges. And for those countries that are struggling, I would also say get priorities right. 
uh, what you have to get right is that you should get healthcare and education as your top priorities. And here, I think also we have to think uh, out of the box how we can more incentivize it. So we have seen uh, innovations changing the whole way we are doing uh, payments. Today, in many countries like uh, Kenya, 70% of all the payments and all the bank accounts are on mobile devices that did not exist 10 years ago. I think also on healthcare, you can have distributed also health services. If you have access uh, to internet and to cells, you can have doctors sitting in Nairobi supporting uh, people, for example, in refugee camps uh, all over uh, the country. So here we have to also be very innovative and we have to work with the private sector. Mm. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I should note that uh, Borger Brenda was in his time Minister of Foreign Affairs in Norway and responsible for the development portfolio. And Norway has been such a generous supporter of international development for so long. And you speak from a, a great deal of knowledge and experience, Borger, and we really appreciate that. Let me come back to Josiah. Uh, Josiah, um, how do you think young people can use their voices and energy to drive efforts to mobilize more policy and funding commitments for women, children, and adolescent health, including mobilizing commitments around the PMNCH call for action uh, on COVID-19. Thanks, Helen. I think there's two main things we can do. And one of them is deepen our personal understandings about what, what needs to happen, but then also help others understand. And, I, one example, we um, the, the Pacific Youth Network that I'm part of here in New Zealand, we had heard after the mosque terror attack that took place in, in, in New Zealand in 2019, that it was uncertain whether Muslim communities would be part of the, the team leading the review of that. And so what we did is we wrote to the, the government using the Official Information Act that they have and 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 got the information, got the information that they weren't going to include uh, anyone who was Muslim or who had lived experience from those teams in, in, the, in the panel. And we, re we released that. So I guess deepening our understanding of the systems in that moment was something that we could use to elevate the voice of, um, of others. Um, also owning, owning our own identity. So one of the big global challenges I see is where we see others as being different and we don't actually embrace that specialness in each and every person. Like as an indigenous person and living in, an, in another indigenous community's land, I think it's very special to understand how we support what indigenous peoples need and indigenous adolescents, women and, adolescent, and indigenous children because in, in the population that we're talking about, there's subpopulations which need extra support. And if we deepen our empathy for that need, we can again add to the step change. And so I suppose to move to the second part around intergenerational activation and advocacy, the more we can bring everyone with us and, and, and helping have that understanding or that focus and having clear asks of those other generations, great things can happen. Like in, in the last few months, our New Zealand government has announced they're going to give an apology for the dawn raids, um, something that took place in the, in the 1970s, uh, targeting um, people of my community in New Zealand. Um, and we, our kaumatua, our, our, our elders, and, and us as young people together wrote, uh, created a letters campaign, a communication campaign to government, and other ways that we raised our voice about it. But we did it across generations. And I know we're seeing that happen in the climate space as well. Um, but it's just making sure that we we all bring all the voices together and 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 we will do that for for pmnch as well and so i guess the last part of that is just helping also target our parliaments and right across our parliaments we don't want any decision maker to be left out of the conversation thank you very much uh, uh, josiah well everyone's made some just a tremendous points today for our community of, of those who advocate and work with and for uh, women, uh, children, adolescents to digest. So I want to give each participant now 
uh, on the panel uh, the opportunity just to share one brief final reflection. And my question would be, if you could have just one priority for how we promote equity in the COVID-19 response and recovery uh, in order to protect the health of women, children and adolescents, what would that priority be? Let's start with global advocate, President Kirsty. Well, at my advocacy level, I've already explained, uh, getting to know about each and every birth wherever globally and getting every birth and child registered. But I have a more overarching, actually, uh, proposal. It was also said today here that it took us a year to do what we normally achieve in 10 when we were developing the vaccines. Why don't we now collectively transfer all this energy to the globally most important causes? One of them, of course, has to be climate change, because, I mean, we are all cooking soon on our earth. This is clear and simple. The other is the attention to, towards our youth, our children and their homes, their families. Domestic violence grows angry people. Angry people make angry societies who are not compassionate about their members of their society. So we need to stop this, to stop this vicious circle and to reach out to every child growing up today. The world has to show the kind face to every child. And if we approach it with the same urgency, this pandemic of lost children, as we are, I mean, approaching this pandemic of COVID-19, mm. we have to achieve. We will definitely achieve. We will definitely conquer all these difficulties which we today have. So let's please not forget how, how we all came together Forgot everything about protectionism, forgot everything about me first, forgot everything about my nation first. We realized we can do it together. And please do not lose this urgency. Please keep this political will to decide. This is all what I'm asking from the world leaders. Let's have this urgency now and resolve the two big issues, climate, children. And then we will have a much better place to live in for all our kids and grandkids. Thank you. Thank you. And I agree, we certainly would have. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Gabriella, uh, please, your one priority, if you could share it. Your thank you. Priority. Thank you very much, Helen. And of course, I must say that uh, without health, we can do a lot of things. Uh, without health, there is no going to be economic recovery. Without health, there's not going to be safety or many other um, common goods or even human rights. So uh, first of all, I would like to, to ask everyone here to be part of the UHC Day campaign, not only until December 12th, but we are soliciting stories from people in all countries to have faced barriers to healthcare or who demonstrate how progress towards UHC has brought positive change to their lives. Anyone can, can submit their story by the end of August through our website, uhc2030.org. It is incredibly important that we collect as many stories as we can, so we can go beyond just the numbers and represent a better, more complete picture of progress towards UHC in all countries. The other issue that we are working on, and I believe it's very important, is that this uh, international partnership, UHC 2030, is precisely a multi-stakeholder partnership. And now we are even being uh, more inclusive. And it is my pleasure to introduce here a new coalition of partnerships for universal health coverage and global health, which will unite health leaders and advocates in a common goal to align advocacy and accountability efforts to achieve UHC and advance the SDGs. The founding members of this coalition are UHC 2030, PMNCH, UNAIDS and NCD Alliance, and the WHO Global NCD Platform, Stop TB Partnership, and the RBM Partnership to End Malaria. So we believe that yes, health is the most important issue here. And being sure that everyone is going to be able to access health is not only a lesson from the pandemic, 
it's a must. It's a matter of justice. It's about being fair, about giving the same opportunities to everyone. And I would like to, to thank uh, President Kirsty for her very kind words about uh, UHC and how Estonia is doing. I think that part of the success of Estonia is that they have been fighting corruption for many years using technology, using transparency, and, and that's something that we have to learn in, in many parts of the world. Uh, that's a, a very powerful lesson. I, I hope that if we can end corruption and use all that money to warranty universal health coverage, I'm sure that we are not going to be suffering for each pandemic or, or disease. It is a matter of, of political will. And it is also a matter of uh, inclusiveness. Uh, I would like to, to uh, have a, only to take a little bit about your shy words. And it is about, uh, yes, it's about uh, fairness. When we see uh, youth at the global level, well, people under 30 years old are more than half of the total world's population. But if we go to parliamentary seats, well, people under 30 are only having about 2.2% of the, of the parliamentary seats. That's not inclusive. That's not democratic. That's not fair. And if we want to take a real inclusive and democratic decisions, and if we are ambitious enough to understand that we can change the planet by 2030, we need to bring all voices to the table. And again, we need to start from universal health coverage. We need to understand the terrible and powerful lessons from this pandemic. So again, I perhaps just as President Kirsty, but I am advocating from my, my own organization, we need to warranty universal health coverage. We need to warranty health for all. So thank you. Thank you very much for this panel. Thank you so much, and particularly for emphasizing that health is just such a fundamental building block of human development. Without our health, we, we, we have nothing. Uh, Borga, uh, Brenda, uh, your top priority, if you could uh, share it now, for promoting more equity in the response and ensuring that women, children, and adolescents don't miss out, and we can try and safeguard the gains we had made. I think it's uh, unacceptable that uh, almost half of the world don't have access to basic health care. 3.6 billion uh, cannot go to the doctor or seek health care uh, if you're giving birth uh, to a child, if you're pregnant, or if children are sick. The cost of inaction here far exceeds the cost of action. And we are not on the track to meet the sustainable development goals when it comes to health. So we have to think out of the box and also differently. When we are now seeing a recovery, unfortunately, the recovery is mainly now in developed countries and in some emerging countries. I'm very concerned that this uh, COVID-19 pandemic can really, really be a big setback for uh, the really gains we saw uh, when it came to the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, but also on the progress we made for SDGs. This year, the World Economic Forum, we do expect that 100 million people will end up in extreme poverty, that we're not in extreme poverty just two years ago. So we have to make sure that when we see this recovery, it has to be inclusive, it has to be sustainable, and it has to create also decent jobs for the billions of adolescents and young people uh, in the world. And here we just have to also show solidarity. We know that COVID anywhere is COVID everywhere, and that counts for also a lot of the other challenges we're up to. So please come together and mobilize for the 3.6 billion people that don't have access to basic healthcare. And the most vulnerable of them are unfortunately pregnant women and children. Thank you for that uh, powerful call. And also we remember that if you don't uh, have universal health coverage, families can be literally ruined by trying to find the money for the health costs. Uh, it's just so important to have universal coverage. Josiah, you're going to get the, the last word uh, on sharing the top priority for action with us. Come Thank off you mute, all. though. 
<laughs> oh, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so mine's twofold. First part is please to uh, the countries and leaders around the world, please sign up to the PMNCH call to action. We've got to have a joined up effort. We, 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 the people in the communities that I'm speaking for tonight deserve that. And so let's do that. And I suppose part of that, you know, we can't forget mental health and health as WHO is calling for, for these populations. And, and as we talked about climate change earlier, you know, it's a social and emotional well-being that's going to help us through the changes and everything that's coming, and specifically for our mums and our young people. Um, in, our, in our community, as we've already, we've already mentioned, we've had the terrorism attack that's happened here in, in Christchurch. We also had the series of earthquakes. And in our earthquakes here, it wasn't until about five years after that the mums and, our, and the women of our community were actually seeking help. And we needed them to have access to that help far earlier because they were the heartbeat of the family. We didn't know that that was something that we as a community need to ramp around them. So I guess my encouragement is that please let's take notice of those needs and let's meet them because our families and, and, and um, our women deserve it. And so let's show more aroha, as um, Mumbai said, more love and, and, and love, love being the action that uh, she encouraged us to do. Well, thank you so much, uh, Afafatai, uh, Josiah, and thank you to all the panellists. We've heard from a head of state, uh, a private sector leader and former foreign minister, a, a very uh, high leader in parliamentary circles globally, and uh, Josiah as a, as a youth leader from my own country. And the emphasis has been so much on political will, on including everyone, on prioritising a health on ensuring that women, children, and adolescents aren't left uh, behind. As Borga Brenda has reminded us, we're, we're on track for a two-track uh, way forward with this pandemic. Uh, some will uh, vaccinate everybody quickly and try to get on with life. We run the danger of leaving literally billions behind. We're in a world where the latest uh, state of the world's food uh, systems report uh, says that 10% of our fellow global citizens are undernourished, that this is not a recipe for a happy world. So let's take encouragement from the leaders across sector in this panel that doesn't have to be like that and that we can, if we combine our efforts, uh, build a better future. Uh, muchas gracias, uh, Fafatai. Uh, thank you to everyone. And back to you, Maziko. Thank you very much, Helen, and thank you very much to all our panelists for that amazing conversation, that empowering conversation and dialogue. And one thing that is clear is that in pandemics such as this, women, children and adolescents unfortunately bear the brunt of this shadow pandemic. And it's very clear from all our speakers today that we cannot move forward without acknowledging and addressing the vulnerabilities that women, children, and adolescents face. Um, but it was amazing to, 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 to just hear from each one of you. And I really hope that everybody that has been listening and watching right now has been taking notes and is really looking forward to just collaborate and work together because clearly um, there is so much action that happens when we work together. There is so much effective impact and sustainable change when we work together. It was wonderful to hear Josiah speak uh, on the elements of the call to action and engaging young people and young people using innovative ways to really just um, bring out the voices and the issues that they're facing. Her Excellency uh, President Ketsi spoke about understanding the root causes and tailoring our approaches to indeed reach every woman, every child and adolescent wherever they live and have all people counted and accounted for. Because if we can do that with ballot papers during political campaigns to make sure everybody votes, if we can, if, if most people currently 
can make a, a phone call or we can make transactions, then we can ensure that every child, every woman is accounted for because how are we going to ensure that our budgeting is really uh, efficient and addressing what is really on the ground. We also heard from Borge Brandt who spotlighted the opportunities for strengthened public-private cooperation and also Gabriella giving us a lot to think about the immediate actions um, needed to address direct and indirect impacts of COVID-19 and a very, very huge thank you to our Right Honourable Helen Clark and the speakers as the countries continue to grapple on COVID-19, they must stay true to their promise of leaving no one behind. We are truly inspired by all of your words and actions and really hope that all these commitments and all these best practices, everything we say we're going to do just, just does not and um, at this dialogue. We hope that even after this, this is just the start and the continuation of what has already been happening and that we can collaboratively work together. Now, as we move forward, we are honored to have two ambassadors from UK and Japan to share their reflections here. So we have um, UK permanent representative uh, ambassador, Barbara Woodward. Ambassador Woodward, as president of the G7 this year, the UK government has pushed for health on the agenda, um, including COVID-19 vaccines to be deployed equitably and to avoid displacement and in a way that strengthens um, health systems. How will the UK commit to ensure con continued leadership in this area and how can the G7 keep themselves accountable for their promises and to really translate these into tangible benefits for the most vulnerable populations and we're uh, for the most vulnerable populations including women um, children and adolescents over to you well Matsiko really tough questions but before I move to them can I start by thanking you by thanking Estonia and by thanking all the partners UNICEF UN Family Planning WHO UNHC 2030, the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health for organising this important dialogue today. As we've heard consistently throughout the panel, women and girls have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. So securing access to vaccines uh, as part of improving gender equality, improving girls' education are absolutely essential uh, to making progress on all 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals. And as you said, Matsiko, uh, we have used our G7 uh, presidency this year to put health at the centre of the agenda. And perhaps I could highlight three themes and then come on to that really important question about accountability. Uh, so the first theme is the G7's commitment to protect and promote women's, children, and adolescent health and well-being. And that includes access to vaccines. Uh, but we also want to promote women and to promote young people like Josiah as leaders in the global response to COVID-19. And so at the G7 summit uh, last month, uh, we galvanized support for global vaccine access and that got us an extra 1 billion vaccine doses over the next year for those in greatest need. But G7 health ministers, when they met before the summit, also called for actions on disruptions to life-saving health services. So for safe delivery, uh, family planning, and supporting strong and resilient health systems uh, post-pandemic. So that's the first theme, the overall healthcare. Uh, the second theme, we've also used our G7 presidency uh, to secure new, uh, progressive and decisive commitments to sexual and reproductive health and rights for all. We won't achieve the SDGs without universal access to comprehensive sexual and reproductive health and rights 
which are fundamental to the empowerment of women and girls. And the third theme that I want to highlight is girls' education. G7 foreign and development ministers uh, endorsed the girls' education declaration, which aims to tackle barriers to girls' education, including, for the first time, a commitment to increasing access to comprehensive sexuality education. And we've heard today, we know just how many girls have been forced out of school by COVID and how few will be able to return. So this is a real priority. So this month at the end of July, alongside Kenya, we will co-host uh, the Global Education Summit in London uh, to raise funds for the Global Partnership for Education. Uh, the UK has pledged 430 million pounds to the Global Partnership and our target is 5 billion and we encourage uh, anyone uh, to join in this critical pledge, which is critical to equality. Now, uh, as you said, Matsiko, and as Helen Clark said too, uh, fine words are uh, one thing, but delivering on those commitments, the accountability is absolutely crit critical. Data is a big part of that, transparency, partnerships that hold us accountable are really important. And I just want to highlight finally, therefore, uh, on accountability, the G7 committed to convening the Gender Equality Advisory Council during future G7 presidencies. Uh, so it will work with the Accountability Working Group and the Tawamina Roadmap to monitor G7 commitments to achieve gender equality annually. So I hope, Matsiko, as you said, if we collaborate and work together, uh, we can make ourselves accountable to every uh, woman and every girl around the world. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you very much for that, Ambassador. Uh, now over to you, uh, Ambassador Ishikan, who is a permanent representative uh, Gabriella spoke about people-centered actions and the importance of social and political accountability for advancing the implementation of the 2019 Universal Health Coverage Political Declaration. As the co-facilitator for the 2023 high-level meeting on the UHC and one of the VNR reporting countries this year, what are your reflections on how to ensure leaving no one behind is part of the UHC progress? Over to you, Ambassador. Well, uh, thank you, Ms. Maziko. And I join Barbara in expressing my special thanks to all uh, of you who made this event possible. Well, uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis you know, has highlighted many things uh, that will be required to ensure human security and sustain our lives, livelihoods and dignity. Uh, the pandemic has exposed, uh, as many has pointed out, social weakness in even in the richest countries. But at the same time, of course, it has had disproportionate impact on the poorest and the most vulnerable people in developing uh, countries. So what should we do then? Uh, let me point out uh, three things here. Number one, all of us, especially governments, need to share common but simple mindset. No one is safe until everyone is safe in this highly connected and globalized world. In spreading this mindset, I think the role of civil societies is extremely important. And this mindset, it's when it's properly shared, will lead us to the efforts aiming at the fair and equitable equal distribution of vaccine for all. And that is why Japan decided to co-host the COVAX AMC summit with the Gavi uh, in June. But this is not enough. Number two, we need to bear in mind that challenges we are facing require multifaceted approaches. Yes, procurement of vaccine is important, but that is not all. We need, we need a system that can make actual vaccinations to happen in meaningful manner. So here comes in the importance of you know, strengthening health systems through achieving universal health coverage. I'm currently working on the GA modality of resolution on the high-level meeting on universal health coverage in 2023. 
I strongly hope the meeting of 2030 will be a great occasion where uh, various key stakeholders in the health sector, including civil societies, will work together to leave no one's health behind. I also hope that coalition will continue to play an active and important role in organizing the 2023 meeting. Number three, we need to think about the best mix of efforts of various players, especially private sector. Given the fact that number one financial influx into developing countries is now FDI, far exceeding ODA, we need to be more creative and innovative in facilitating the bigger role played by private sector in the health sector as well. But in the same context, COVID crisis has shed light on the importance of private sector in vaccine protection, but, but at the same time, the indispensable role to be played by public sector in helping public sector in that regard. In concluding my remarks, let me draw your attention to the uh, concerns about the slow progress we would see due to the COVID-19 pandemic. As pointed out in the State of UHC Commitment Report released by UHC uh, 2030 last December, we should continue to explore how to implement UHC commitments steadily and strengthen accountability at the national level. But finally, the importance of VNR voluntary national review. The group of friends of UHC held a VNR workshop on SDG3 last April here in New York. VNR process is important to strengthen member states' efforts to achieve more comprehensive country-led assessment of progress in the health sector. Uh, Japan, for its part, has prepared its second VNR report this year, focusing on the review of the health sector, including inverse health coverage. We hope you will have the chance to listen to a VNR presentation on Thursday morning. And I expect that the coalition members can make additional contribution in this regard through its partners. Thank you very, very much for having me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I just also wanted to acknowledge the comments that are coming in. Thank you, everybody, for posing your reflections, your, your questions, sharing your remarks. And we do acknowledge that health, health workers and midwives play a critical role and the issues that they have must also be innovatively and strategically addressed. Now, uh, so we're coming to an end, uh, to the end of this uh, amazing and empowering discussion. And like I mentioned earlier, that this is a very, very important discussion and countries have shared their best practices. And if something, if I had to summarize all the inputs that have come from all our speakers, it really just keeps bringing me back to the COVID-19 call to action. Because from there, we're seeing that we really need to take action to protect women, adolescents, and children because they're disproportionately affected in pandemics such as this. We really, really need to deliver our promise on the multi-sectoral multi approaches. And we've really seen the power of partnerships and there's so much more that we can do collectively. And most importantly, number three, we really need to ensure that nothing is for us without us. We cannot talk about young people without engaging them in all of our processes. We cannot guess and imagine what they go through. They need to be part of the decision-making processes. And we need to make sure that everybody is part of the conversation. And we have seen that we just can't only focus on the health sector, but we need partnerships that go beyond the health sector. And we've heard so much about the public partnerships and private partnerships. And it is clear that we're all linked together and we can collectively make a difference. I just, when Josiah was sharing his reflections earlier, he talked about, he was um, remembering this song when he was a child. And I also remember when I was nine years old, not knowing what I wanted to do and become, but I knew that I wanted to be part of something that is bigger than myself. I grew up in a rural community that didn't have access to water, to electricity, and all these health services that we're talking about right now. And to be part of this dialogue and to hear leaders that have the resources, the tools to really make the, the change we want to see a reality 
is something that's exciting, but we have to go beyond just talking and we need actions. We need actions, we need commitments, and we need investments in adolescent well-being and health. Thank you to everybody for your thoughts and your work and passion on this issue. I hope the conversations today have inspired everybody from the policymakers in the highest position to the most affected by the pandemic. And to all those who are part of this journey and want to be part of this journey, remember that your voice, your input and your action is vital. You are important, your voice is important, your experiences are important, and you're not just a statistic. The people who don't have access to these services are not just statist statistics, they're human beings. They have lives, they don't have access to these services, and these rights are basic human rights, fundamental to their well being. So, we need to really ensure that we're using our resources, our tools, our voices to highlight the inequities, to highlight the vulnerabilities that these vulnerable groups face, but to really, really make change. Because if we were able to do something in a year that is usually done in a decade, then we can achieve the sustainable development goals. Your actions today will help us realize our goals tomorrow. Thank you very much and until next time.